Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in the CERDOP and ESTCT webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the organizer of the webinar series on behalf of CERDOP and ESTCT. My colleague, Jennifer Nyman, and I will be co-facilitating today's event. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of, this, um, of the CERDOP and ESTCP uh, program by Dr. John Hall, followed by a sneak peek at a few of the upcoming webinars in CERDOP and ESTCP's newly launched webinar series. Uh, following John's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. The webinar features two speakers who will discuss new tools for advancing our understanding of marine mammal behavioral ecology. We will start with Dr. Patrick Miller from St. Andrews University in the United Kingdom, who will give a 30-minute presentation followed by a short Q&A session. Patrick will be followed by Dr. Kelly Benoit Bird from Oregon State University, who will also give a 30-minute presentation followed by a short Q&A session. We will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session, including both speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we encourage you to submit questions in advance of that session. With almost 200 attendees on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open all the lines for all our questions. Therefore, the phone lines will remain listen only throughout the presentation. And with that, I would like to turn it over, uh, to, turn it over to Dr. John Hall, who is the Startup and ESTCP Program Manager for the Resource Conservation and Climate Change Program area. John has been with Startup and ESTCP since 2006, and prior to that, he was the Sonoran Desert Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy of Arizona. Uh, thank you, John. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rilla, and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar series, and especially this one in particular for the marine mammal research that CERDIP is funding. I don't know if everybody on the call is, is completely familiar with the two programs, so I'll just very briefly give you an overview of CERDIP and an overview of the STCP, just to put what we are into context. So CERDIP is a program that's been around since the early 90s, established by statute by Congress, and it's actually a program that is a tri-agency program where DOD, in partnership in D with Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Ad Agency, oversee the program. It's a requirements-driven program, but it can do anything from fundamental research to advanced technology development. ESTCP, on, on the other hand, is our sister demonstration program. So it demonstrates late-stage technologies in the environment and energy fields, it tries to capitalize on past investments and transition technology out of the lab or field into the hands of end users, and at the same time try to facilitate the regulatory acceptance of those technologies and approaches. We are organized in five broad program areas, energy and water, environmental restorations, munitions response, the program that I manage here, resource conservation and climate change, and weapon systems and platforms, a broad range of various environmental topics that we can address. Within the RC program area, the three main areas include natural resources, uh, all the climate change work, rather natural resource or built infrastructure related, and a couple of air quality issues that relate to fugitive dust and fire. Under natural resources is where uh, the current set of projects you'll be hearing about today lie, and they come under our living marine resources, ecology, and management area focus. Um, Early on in, in uh, with partnership with uh, Office of Naval Research, uh, the N45 Environmental Shop and the Navy and NOAA, uh, we've identified a certain um, important key fundamental research questions that are necessary to address in terms of marine mammals, and especially how our naval operations may affect those species. So it was a set of research questions identified a few years ago by those entities one of which was to get a better understanding of the baseline ecology of marine mammals, 
as a way to better understand behavioral response due to naval activities. So the two projects you're going to hear about today are two of the, of the research projects in that line of effort. There's two others. Uh, but these in particular will discuss some very unique tools and methods they are developing for studying marine mammal behavioral ecology. So as Rula mentioned, this is the second in a series. Uh, we are the November 6th series right here, and I'll turn it over to Rula to carry us into the speakers. Great. Thank you, John. And I just want to remind everybody, if you would like to find out what's coming next in terms of uh, this free webinar series, uh, please log into the CERTIF and ESTCC website for a schedule through May of 2015. And with that, we'd like to start with our first speaker. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Patrick Miller. Dr. Miller is an associate professor at the University of St. Andrews in the United Kingdom. His research focuses on communication and behavioral ecology of marine animals uh, or mammals and evaluating how life in the sea affects behavior and physiology. Uh, Patrick was a vid visiting professor at the University of Tokyo in 2011 and was the recipient of the very prestigious Kobe Award in 2013. And with that, we'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Miller. Well, thank you very much, Rula, for the kind introduction. And thank you to everyone out there listening on the World Wide Web. It's a real pleasure for me to present the research uh, results to date of our project on body condition of cetaceans. And the actual title of my talk is, is Fat Floats, uh, which is a very convenient thing, it turns out, because it's what allows us to, to use tags that we attach to the animals to measure the body condition of whales at sea. So uh, to start off with, I'd like to mention, of course, that the work I'm presenting it was only possible with the input and collaboration of many partners. I'd like to particularly acknowledge the ship and science crews during our research at sea and the highly skilled input of uh, two data analysts, uh, Tomoko Narazaki and Sana Isoyuno, in my lab here in St. Andrews. Okay, so in this uh, webinar, I'm going to introduce the problem that the research addresses, specifically the effects of sonar on cetaceans, uh, which is the whales, dolphins, and porpoises of the world, and uh, then uh, describe a little bit of, of the fundamental concept of body condition, which uh, we believe is a key for behavioral ecology of these animals in the ocean, and then a uh, little discussion about how body condition is measured currently in whales at sea, then move on to describe the new tool to measure body condition that we're developing for the project and give you some results reporting the precision of the tool with uh, a beaked whale, and then uh, f ending up with some applications of this new method. Okay, <clears throat> so the overarching motivation for our research is a well-known problem that underwater noise, and specifically sonar sounds that are produced by the Department of, Fe of Defense, the U.S. Navy, uh, in their important work, can unfortunately disturb the behavior of cetaceans. Now, in the example I'm showing here, this is some data published by uh, Peter Tyak and colleagues in 2011, that showed that beaked whales uh, foraging on the Navy range in uh, the Autec uh, Test Canyon in the Bahamas stopped foraging during Navy range tests, which included sonar activity. So in, in panel A on the left, you can see the whales were feeding over a wide area over this Navy range, but stopped feeding in this core, sort of core central region during the tests. And it took some time for the whales after to come back and continue their feeding uh, in that habitat. So this kind of a behavioral response uh, clearly indicates that there's something about the sonar that the whales don't like, but it's a little bit unclear to understand exactly what the consequences of this might have been to the animals. So did the animals move away from this area and continue feeding normally, or did they actually have difficulty finding food uh, during that time? So in, indeed, this is part of a, a larger overall question, which is how can we relate uh, the effects of sound to what we would consider biologically significant or important effects on the animals. So in 2005, the National Research Council developed a conceptual model that takes us all the way from the sounds that are uh, produced by, uh, by people uh, making sound in the ocean, such as the Navy, and connecting that through to the behavioral changes that the sound uh, causes, and the behavioral change then affects some life function, which is something to do with feeding, breeding, the important activities of animals. 
And then it's, we believe that those life functions are critical to the, light, to the vital rates of each individual animal. So the uh, survival and reproduction and ability of animals to grow depends crucially, of course, on their ability to feed and other life functions. So it's ultimately the vital rates of individuals, animals that we're interested in, and those feed, to then, feed through then to population effects. Uh, so, for example, if we understand how vital rates of individuals might be affected by these sounds, we can uh, quantify how populations might be affected. But there's some really important gaps in our understanding of this conceptual model that we think body condition can play an important role in helping address. So one is that we have a weak ability to predict the likelihood of disturbance responses. So just going from sound to the behavioral change is, is currently a challenge. We, we're not clear exactly what factors might influence that, and we believe body condition can be an important component of that. Then uh, another key gap here is to go from the effects when a life function is affected by a sound and how that might play through to the vital rates of an individual animal. Notice there's a little zero here in the graph because there's almost no information that can connect together the life function and the vital rates of an individual. Okay, so body condition. When we speak about body condition, what we're talking about in general is the health of the animal according to some metric. And what we're specifically targeting in our study is the fat store body condition. So fat store represents an integrated outcome of the energy intake and expenditure of animals uh, foraging in their natural environment and is an indication of their health status. Now, across a wide range of species, body condition, and particularly lipid store body condition, is an uh, important predictor of survival of individuals and reproductive success and survival of those offspring as well. And this has been shown in a wide range of animals from spiders all the way through to seals. It's also known that body condition can influence behavior of individuals. For example, an animal that is starving, which has a very poor body condition, will put up with all sorts of, uh, of risk factors such as predation or human disturbance in order to keep feeding, uh, which is quite different from a well-fed animal, which actually might be more sensitive to disturbance and just move away since they can afford to move away uh, more easily. Okay, so body condition is something clearly that's important in behavioral ecology of animals, and people have been looking this, at this in cetaceans, and there is uh, uh, two, two methods I'm uh, highlighting here have been quite effective at studying body condition in cetaceans. So one is visual assessment of animals, literally be encountering animals at sea and, and assessing their condition by, uh, uh, by looking at their body form. And it's clear in the panels here that you can see a poor condition animal in panel E in Bradford's uh, study from 2012 versus a very healthy, nice, fat-looking animal. So we, the judgment would be that uh, B is a healthy animal with a, a nice lipid store, whereas E is not a healthy animal, which has a poor lipid store. Another method that's been widely used is aerial ph photogrammetry, where the width of the animal is uh, measured and compared uh, to its length, and we can see changes in that which reflect its fat store. So in the example that's shown here, the width of a particular right whale was shown to have been uh, wider and they're more fat, essentially, uh, during the period when the animal was pregnant than later when it was lactating and using that fat to feed its offspring. So this highlighted nicely how the fat store is actually cycled to benefit the offspring of the right whale in that case. Now, these methods are, are very nice, and they've led to a lot of important results, uh, but they do have some important weaknesses, which our study, uh, we hope to advance the field in some way. One is that uh, the visual assessment method can only be done for animals that can be observed e fairly easily at sea, where you can get a good look at the animal from different directions. And for some species, like the beaked whales, that's very difficult to do. It's hard enough to even find them in the first place, and to be able to do repeated inspections is very difficult. And likewise, aerial photogrammetry is not always effective to measure body store. Uh, some animals actually replace their fats with uh, water. So it may, they might actually look nice and fat, but actually not have uh, a lipid inside their normal body store compartments. So what is really needed is a method that will allow us to derive the total lipid content of animals in some sort of quantitative replicable way that hopefully can be applied to a wide range of species. Now, there is a nice method that does get at total lipid body store that's been applied in elephant seals. And this uh, method uses the drift rate of seals, which have a very uh, interesting behavior. These seals dive down to depth and then literally drift. And we think that they're just resting or 
uh, perhaps listening uh, out to the ocean as they just drift along. And their drift rate, the amount of the change of depth over that drifting period, is a consequence of the buoyancy force that they are affected by. And of course, the drift rate is where that buoyancy force just equals the drag that they experience at that speed. So the drift rate is the terminal speed, which is driven by the buoyancy force and the drag. And the key factor is that the buoyancy of the animal, of the elephant seals, is affected critically by the lipid store. The amount of fat that the animal has is what determines its buoyancy. And this is a consequence of the fact that fat floats, and lipid has a lower density than the rest of the body. So lipid, as part of the body store, is less dense than seawater, whereas most of the other components of the body are more dense than seawater. So an animal with very low lipid will tend to be negatively buoyant, and as it adds, gains more lipid, then it will become positively buoyant. So to apply this towards, uh, towards marine divers in general, we can think of the relationship between body density and net buoyancy related to fat store is that lipid, because it is less dense than seawater and the other tissues are slightly more dense than seawater, leads to the consequence that fat whales, which we think of then are probably a fat happy whale, which has uh, have been successful at acquiring its resources, will have a lower body density and a higher, uh, therefore a higher positive buoyancy, so they will float up uh, in the water. As opposed to a lean animal, which will have a, a, a higher body density and overall a net negative buoyancy when it's in uh, swimming around in the sea. So for the seals case, we have a very nice scenario where the whale is just drifting down at sea and we can tell its buoyancy by this drift speed uh, that it achieves. However, not all species perform drift dives. In fact, there's only very few that have been demonstrated to perform drift dives. So how can we consider to change this approach or use this uh, fundamental factor of buoyancy and drag forces for animals that don't do drift dives? And the key here is that while drift, drift diving itself might be rare, all divers that have been studied to date do, some, do a form of drift, drifting by gliding during ascent or descent phases of dive. So the key here is that the animal is not actively thrusting and actively swimming, but is allowing its buoyancy to give it a bit of a free ride while it's swimming along. So during that period when it's gliding, again, the same factors of the buoyancy force and the drag force are affecting its movement during those periods of gliding. Okay, so when we look at these vertical glides, they're not always straight up and down, like a drifting elephant seal would just drift up or down in the water column, but instead we know that these, uh, during the ascent and descent phase of, uh, of transit from the surface down to depth and back again for these divers, that they often modulate the pitch angle that they swim at. Um, and the pitch angle is, is important because it affects the way in which the force of buoyancy acts on the forward motion of the animal. So the force of buoyancy, of course, is a gravity force and is strictly vertical, but the uh, component of that in the axis of movement of the animal depends upon that pitch angle. So we need to account for that. And then it's also important just to keep in mind that the drag force uh, that the animal's experience is a function of speed. So we need to, to measure the speed of the animal uh, during these uh, behaviors to be able to apply this method. And it's also important to consider that the buoyancy force of the animal comes not only from its tissues, so the fat store, the thing that we're interested in, but also from gases that they carry. So we need to also worry about how much gas the animal's diving down as that can affect its buoyancy as well. So we need to account for all of these factors. And we do have mathematical formulae that allow us uh, to uh, describe these mathematically and mathematically compute and solve for these different factors in the data. Now, um, turning now to some of the actual data, so we've been working with a beaked whale, the bottlenose whale, northern bottlenose whale, which has a habitat in the North Atlantic. Uh, we've been working in two primary field sites, uh, one in Jan Mayen, north of Iceland, where uh, uh, up until last summer, we have only managed to get one tag on, although we did manage to get some more tags than this on in 2014. I'm not able to present those new data because we're still finalizing them. However, uh, we also collected more data, six different records from the goalie off of uh, the east coast of Nova Scotia in Canada.
Now, these tags are attached to whales using suction cups. So it's a non-invasive method where we attach the animals either, sorry, we attach the tags to the animals either using poles, pushing the tag on the whales, or uh, launching uh, the tags onto the whale with a remote launching system known as the ARTS tagging system, which allows us to tag the animals from a bit farther away and has actually been very helpful uh, for our project. Now, there's also, uh, in these different uh, study sites, we've been using two different types of tags. One is the, uh, the D tag, which uh, you can see here, uh, and the other is a Japanese uh, uh, produced tag uh, here, the 3M PD 3GT tag. And these tags have slightly different characteristics, but both of them record information that we need to solve our equations, our mathematical equations. So the duration uh, of the two different tags is roughly equivalent uh, in that they're deployed with suction cups. They stay on for less than a day, several hours, but never more really than one day. They both record depth at high resolution with a nice uh, high sampling rate. And the accelerometer is a key sensor that both of these devices have that recorded at a high rate. And the accelerometer is crucial to allow us to calculate this pitch angle, but also to identify those periods when the animal is gliding versus actively thrusting because the accelerometer records the wiggling movements of the animals as they're swimming up and down in the water column. The last parameter that we need to record is speed. Now the Japanese logger actually has a propeller in the front of the tag that you can see here that records speed quite accurately, speed through the water directly. The D-tag doesn't have this sort of sensor, so we have to calculate speed through the water using how quickly the animal is changing its steps corrected by the sign of pitch. Now this, of course, is, is a slightly indirect method of measuring speed. So one of our questions in applying this method has been, do we need this speed sensor uh, on our tag to be able to apply this method or not? Okay, so here's an example of some data from the northern bottlenose whale from the Goli. So what we see here at the top is speed of the animal through the water measured by this propeller. The dive profile is shown here. You can see the animal dove down to about 1,600 meters, quite a nice uh, deep diver. Now the pitch data is quite uh, important here, and I want to highlight the fact that this uh, particular animal in the Goli conducts very steep uh, pitch ascents and descents of its dive, so, and that's very helpful for calculating the uh, body density of the animal because that's steep. The steeper they are, the buoyancy effect of, uh, inter, uh, influences the forward movement of the animal more. So the steeper, the better for this method. The final column here shows the actual stroking actions of the animal, and you can see there's periods where the animal is stroking with intermittent glides here, and other periods of stroking interspersed with uh, longer glides. So to to actually go ahead and uh, uh, conduct our analysis on the data then, we, we take our data set and identify the gliding periods using the uh, longitudinal acceleration. And here you see the gliding period here in the thrusting data, which we've color-coded as green here on the speed uh, trace, just to make it a little bit easier for you to see. And this makes sense here. The animal's speeding up when the animal's actively swimming in blue and then slows down while it's gliding. In some cases, they can glide at a pretty steady rate if that buoyancy is helping them with the glide. Uh, here in the ascent phase, you see the animals doing also uh, burst and glide swimming, and you can see the animals actually slowing down quite strongly during those glide phases uh, during the ascent phase. So the way uh, the, way the method is actually done me uh, mechanically in terms of the handling is we identify these glide periods and then measure the parameters uh, that we need to from five-second duration glide intervals that we separate from each other by at least five seconds to try to eliminate autocorrelation in the data. Okay, so turning to uh, our results uh, to date, uh, here shows the body density of uh, the seven different whales that we've uh, studied uh, uh, to date. And what we see uh, shown here is a confidence interval, a credible interval of the body density of each individual whale that's differently color-coded, and the codes of the different whales are shown here. So there's three uh, primary uh, conclusions to, to take from this data. First is that we're able to obtain estimates of body density that are very precise. You can see for most of the animals, we're able to get a credible range that covers about one unit, of one kilogram per meter squared. In other cases where we don't have as much data, perhaps the tag fell off a bit earlier from the whale, or in uh, this case where we have a very extreme, very dense whale, 
we have slightly less uh, precision in our estimate. But overall, uh, even in these worst cases, we're within about two units, two kilograms per meters cubed. And this relates, uh, corresponds to about 1% body fat is our resolution. So we believe we can apply this method to this species and measure body fat to within a 1% resolution, which is quite uh, precise. The other important result is that in here we have three different data records that were obtained using the DTAG and the other four using the speed sensor tag, and we obtain equivalently uh, precise results using either of these devices. So that's encouraging that we're able to use the DTAG. We don't need a speed sensor in particular to do this work. We can essentially do this uh, analysis using a depth sensor and accelerometer alone, so it enables the possibility to use a very simple tag to uh, conduct this type of research. Uh, finally, I'd like to stress the fact that we do see differences between individuals. And uh, we only have a few samples so far. We're just at the starting phases of our project. But uh, we're beginning to see um, differences. For example, our Yan Mayan animal here is uh, less dense, so therefore we think it has more fat than the other animals from the Goli. And we're looking right now at more data from Yan Mayan to try to confirm if this is a general trend or not. And we also see an adult male that has the very highest body density of all that, the, that we've recorded so far. So we're going to continue to fill in this data set and, and uh, detail some of the explanatory reasons behind these variations in body density. Okay, so the body density estimate uh, is, of some, is, is something that we can estimate uh, to high precision, but it's difficult to validate this in the real world. We can't actually catch these whales and try to actually calculate, well, how much fat do they have by doing some more traditional measurements. But one form of validation that we have is to look at the percentage of gliding that the animals do. So we expect an animal that has a high body density to get more of a free ride during the descent phase, so the way down during the dive. And, so there, and that is exactly what we're be beginning to see in our data. So animals with high density are gliding more on the descent phase than animals with lower density. And the opposite is true on the way up, that the denser animals actually glide less on the way up than the uh, more buoyant, positively buoyant animals. So this is some validation, at least, that the measurements that we're getting are actually valid representations of the fat store and the buoyancy of these animals. Okay, so we've also been working with a shallow diving humpback whale uh, in our project. Now, this is a very different animal from a, a beaked whale. Uh, humpback whales are well-known uh, seasonal feast and famine uh, whales. So they spend uh, summertime feeding intensively at higher latitudes and then migrate to uh, uh, more uh, mid-latitudes to mate. And during these mating periods, they actually do not... Um, uh, feed at all, and their fat stores therefore cycling every every year for the animals that do these migrations between uh, basically being quite hungry and starved at the end of their mating and breeding season, uh, at which they spend in warmer waters. Then they migrate up to the feeding grounds, and they spend the entire summer laying on a lot of fat. And presumably, before they migrate away from those feeding grounds, they've laid on a, quite a substantial amount of fat to carry them over the long fasting period. So there's quite some interesting questions to look at uh, with humpback whales uh, in terms of their fat store body condition as well. Now, we're um, still just uh, finalizing our initial analyses of humpback whales, and um, what some of the challenges that we're finding here is that because they're shallower diving than these beaked whales, um, uh, it leads to challenges for our method. So in the example that's shown here, that is a, just a single dive from a humpback whale, you see that the deepest part of this dive is about 120 meters. So that's, uh, beaked whales, remember, are diving about 10 times this depth. So any given individual dive for a humpback whale will have fewer glides in general because these glides are shallower. We also see glides occur at shallower pitches because they swim in general at shallower pitches. And humpback whales, at least during the feeding season, are quite busy feeding. And so most of the data has some interesting behaviors. For example, during the ascent period, we quite often see lunging behavior, which is uh, highlighted here where the animal speed up, speeds up quite strongly during the ascent and then suddenly slows down uh, as it nears the surface. So this also interferes with our ability to conduct our method. But you can still see there are some glides. Here's an example one for humpback whales that are valid to use in our study. And we are beginning to obtain some estimates of body density for this species. Um, and that's uh, continued work for us to do on the project. OK, so what are some applications that we'd like to pursue uh, from this new tool? 
So because this tool now, with uh, the Beak 12 at least, we're able to measure body density using only a depth and accelerometer sensor, it's possible to integrate this into a very small tag, which means that it could be in integrated and implemented, this algorithm could be implemented on a longer term tag. So our, the tags in our study are suction cup tags, which only stay on for about a day. So we can't actually see changes in an individual's um, body condition over time using a suction cup tag. But with a longer duration tag, where the result of body density is sent back by satellite, we could begin to look at longer term changes in body condition. And for example, we might be able to monitor the body condition of whales before, during, and after a disturbance, like the uh, beaked whales that are disturbed by Navy tests in the AUTEC range. So this method will allow for more sensitive analysis of sonar effects uh, in, in certain settings. Another application that we'd like to pursue of the method is to validate other uh, body condition indices and to uh, essentially cross uh, what our measurement of a fat store would be using body density versus what uh, the experts judge by looking at visual assessment. And we think this is important because it's, it's difficult to tag whales in general. We can't go out very easily and tag an entire population of animals, but visual assessment or photogrammetric uh, uh, methods are more widely applicable. So it would be very helpful to validate some of these visual methods to confirm that uh, differences in uh, body condition indices actually relate to changes in the lipid store and to provide a quantitative measure for these visual, uh, visual scores to relate what these actually mean in terms of quantitative lipid store for the animals. Uh, finally, uh, we're uh, transitioning our technology on to uh, folks that are, are studying the response of whales uh, to sonar sounds in behavioral response studies. And we believe that body condition may be an important factor that influences the responsiveness of animals. So the method is uh, available to teams that are working with tag data from behavioral response studies, uh, including the SoCal BRS team, 3S, uh, the Braz study, and others uh, working under the umbrella of the MOCA project uh, here in St. Andrews. Okay, so conclusions are that body condition reflects the health of animals in their natural environment and has the potential to be a useful to tool uh, to address some Department of Defense needs. We developed a new tool to quantitatively measure body density of, of, of whales and fat content, and we've applied it so far to the deep diving beaked whale effectively but the method has the potential to work across a wide range of cetaceans, including the humpback whales, and also indeed other seals which don't do those drift dives. So potentially has a very wide applicability. We were able to obtain very precise estimates for the deep divers, about 1% of their fat store. Uh, we're working hard now to quantify how well we can do with the humpback whales. And uh, we hope that this new tool will enable new approaches for the Department of Defense to monitor and interpret these effects of their activities on the environment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, for a very interesting presentation. I would like to remind our audience to submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. We did receive a number of questions, Patrick, and here's the first one. Could you please talk a little bit about how you can estimate the gas store and whether or not this plays a significant role in the confidence interval? Uh, yes, the gas store, I can show you I have a supporting slide which uh, shows, oops, I beg your pardon. Uh, here I'm showing the results of the body density for the different whales, but also in this slide um, I'm showing the estimate of the volume of air carried by the bottlenose whale so this is actually a parameter that we estimate from the GLIDE data. So the, uh, the volume of air that's estimated is uh, 13.8, uh, which is uh, milliliters per kilogram of, uh, for, for each whale. And this is actually a pretty close correspondence with the uh, expected lung volume of this species, which is, was measured by Scholander back in the 1940s. And, and of course, this uh, air will affect the buoyancy of the animal uh, very strongly, but it will most importantly affect it near the surface where the gas is expanded. Uh, as the animal dives down to deeper depths, greater pressure will compress that air down. So with elephant seals, uh, the studies have looked at actually deeper than about 100 meters, you can ignore the effects of the air. So for the deep diving beaked whales, um, we're able to estimate the volume of air and account for it very effectively because they're, they're deeper dives. 
For the shallower diver humpback whale, though, it's more, it has a more important effect because more of the glides are done at shallow depths where this volume of air is quite substantial and affects the body uh, estimate. So what we need to do is actually estimate the dive-by-dive -dive variability in the volume of air estimate itself. And that is one of the main challenges with the humpback whales as a shallow diver. So it is indeed challenging, but we can quantify the amount of air the, the animals are carrying, which is actually interesting uh, scientifically in its own right, and we can account for its influence on the buoyancy. Wonderful. Thank you. And here's a question slash comment. How are you planning to take the density values to predict body composition? It seems like you might need some body morphometric data. I think you stated that your methods had a resolution of 1% body fat. How did you determine that from density values? Uh, that's a very good question. The 1% body fat estimate is derived from elephant seals, where there has been quite a lot of work looking at body density of all the different components and uh, thereby uh, confirming that the uh, difference in overall body density of about two points is equivalent to about 1% fat. Now, of course, a whale is not the same as a seal. There are some differences there. And so, of course, for each species, we need to consider uh, how well these values might relate to specific fat stores. And this is a difficult problem to, to try to solve because, of course, the animals are free living at sea. And the only way to measure its fat store in, in some more robust way is to uh, either inspect a carcass where we can cut and look at the thickness of the fat store or somehow do a very complete ultrasound scan over the whole body. Uh, neither of those are practical with living animals at sea. So what we can pursue this, though, further uh, in the unfortunate cases when animals strand and we have a, a, you know, a relatively uh, freshly dead animal, we can look at the body density of different components in, in those cases. And uh, we think that is a very important part of the study. And there also may be interesting uh, differences uh, between uh, different animals in this regard. So, for example, the adult male that we have, st uh, the only adult male that we've tagged, has the highest density, overall total body density. And that could actually be very much driven by the fact that male beaked whales are known to have very dense bones uh, that seem to play a role in male male competition. So, it could be that. Some of the differences here are not due to fat store, but due to differences, sex differences in density of different body compartments. So there are a lot of details and questions that we need to work toward to actually go from body density to a true fat value for these different species. Great, thank you. And, and here's another uh, really good question. How do you actually measure Navy training impact and body conditions? Okay, so this so is a, a yeah. Go so ahead. this is a yeah. The idea. Thank you. Yes, it's it's a good question, and it relates to our application of how we might use this technology to study the changes in an individual's body condition over time if it's affected by a um, by an activity. So we're able to estimate uh, using our suction cup tags here a uh, very precise value of its body density at a given point in time. Then by uh, if we're able to implement this on a longer-term tag that can essentially derive this estimate on a daily basis and send the result back by satellite, then we can actually track how an individual's body density might change over time uh, during uh, this uh, response period. So if we tag an animal, for example, with a location tag that's able to also process this information, then we can look at uh, where the animal went and how, for example, did it avoid the loud sound and move away, uh, perhaps we can also record the depth of its diving to determine does it look like it's feeding or not. But then importantly, we can look and see this body density, has it actually gone, uh, gone up, indicating that the animal is losing fat and not feeding effectively. So this, uh, this uh, tool would allow us to actually specifically address for those individuals uh, changes in their uh, body condition over time during these exercises. Great. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, possibly a related question. Uh, isn't it going to take years to get a sufficient baseline of the range and variability before the method can be used to determine if disturbance is related to DOD activities being monitored? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes, it will take years 
to get uh, overall baseline looking at different animals like this on a snapshot basis. And in particular, if you wanted to use this method with, at, with short-term tags, it would be very challenging because there's going to be a wide variation across different individuals in their body density for a lot of different reasons. So we're, we're actually proposing the most effective way to, to study body condition changes in relation to DOD activities is by using a longer duration tag where you're actually looking at longitudinal changes in a single individual's body condition over time. And in that case, of course, we'd still want the baseline data to put uh, the changes into a broader context, but we could actually um, potentially be able to do those studies immediately. Thank you, Patrick. One last quick question, and then uh, we'll have the opportunity to continue with uh, Q&A for you towards the end, Patrick. Um, okay. I think somebody's uh, seeing all the places you get to visit um, doing research, and they're wondering if you have additional funding in addition to third up uh, for your research. Um, yes, we do. We, uh, we do take uh, some funding that we get from charitable uh, organizations like World Wildlife Fund that uh, help us to get time at sea. And uh, CERDUP is, of course, uh, very, uh, I believe, being very responsible to try to pursue these uh, types of solutions. But the problem is also faced by a lot of other noise producers in the, in the world's oceans, not just the Navy and Department of Defense. But I, I believe that the oil and gas industry has a responsibility to look at this issue, and there are, are, are other uh, funding uh, sources out there to address this question. Thank you very much, Patrick. This was absolutely fascinating, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Nyman, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Jennifer, please go ahead. Thanks, Rula. Our second speaker for today will discuss deep mapping squid feeding whales and their prey fields. Dr. Kelly Benoit Bird is a professor at Oregon State University where she examines a wide range of animals, including fish, squid, and marine mammals using active acoustics, or sonar, to understand the role of spatial heterogeneity and temporal patterns in marine ecosystems. In 2010, Kelly was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, which most of us are familiar with as the Genius Award. Kelly, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, so Patrick just gave you a really nice introduction to the problem with beaked whales and one of the potential results, which is body condition. And I'd like to talk about the mechanisms that might lead to a given body condition under changing conditions. And specifically, that's how animals might find food and how that's shaped by their environment. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about beaked whales, although you've heard a lot um, from Patrick's talk. But I'd like to point out what we really don't know, and that's a lot about their food, and tell you why we don't. Uh, introduce a new tool that we've been developing to help fill this gap in our understanding about uh, deep water prey resources, and present some of our results from a study within a Navy testing range off California, and finally conclude by a brief discussion about the implications for beach whales and management. I do want to point out that uh, this is part of a team effort. Um, my co-investigators are Mark Moline from the University of Delaware and Brandon Southall from Southall Environmental Associates. And of course, the participation of uh, technical staff and graduate students help make this work possible. So beaked whales are amongst the least known of the large mammals in part because of their deep water behavior, their unobtrusive surfacing, and their lack of any gregarious behaviors. We do know that they feed um, almost exclusively on deep water squid, primarily from uh, genetic analyses and gut contents, as well as from specimens brought up to the surface by these animals when they're done foraging. And again, I seem to be having a little con trouble controlling the slides here. So interestingly, they suction feed on these deep water squid, taking them only one at a time, which is important to think about the mechanisms by which they're foraging. We do know that these animals, okay, again, I, I seem to be unable to control the slides there, are um, particularly sensitive to anthropogenic sound sources, uh, and which has resulted in um, uh, unfortunate events like mass strandings and the association with military sonar activities. 
And in part as a result of that and in, because of investments by DOD, our knowledge of their behavior and biology has been greatly advanced. And while our studies of their physical habitat have kept pace with these advances, our knowledge of their prey behavior has not. And that's largely because uh, squid are fast, large, and live incredibly deeply, which makes them um, not very amenable to traditional sampling tools. Um, so we have been able to study squid using some alternative means. <coughs> And we've been developing um, acoustic tools to be able to sample squid, primarily, though, in shallower waters. So by doing this, we're using high-frequency sound. We send out a pulse of sound that's made up of a number of different frequencies or pitches. And we bounce that off of um, things in the habitat, uh, like the seafloor or um, animals. And each of the different colors you see here represents a different pitch of sound. And in the case of the dolphin, the sound we get back would look very much like the one we sent out, with all of the different frequencies represented fairly evenly. But when we look at a squid, even one the same size as a dolphin, we get only the low frequency information back strongly here shown in red. And the high frequency information is cut down by about half. And that's quite different than the things, uh, other things in the habitat, other invertebrates in particular, like the small krill or shrimp-like organisms that these squid are foraging on in shallow water. Um, these organisms give us only the highest frequency information back, and we lose all the low frequency information together, altogether. So when we put this information together, we can actually separate different organisms in the habitat. If we get the right signals, we can sometimes make size estimates of these organisms, and we can um, be able to separate them from each other. But this tool really only helps us um, for a range of about 600 meters, and we know that beaked whales are foraging down at depths between 1,000 and 1,200 meters. So our goal was to be able to get information down at the depth at which beaked whales were actually foraging. And to do this, um, we're using a deep water autonomous underwater platform. Now this platform is capable of diving to a depth of about 600 meters, and so we can still get that five or 600 meter range from our scientific echo sounders and be able to see squid at depths of 1,000 to 1,200 meters. So this is a picture of the um, uh, deep ocean remus. It has a dive depth of about 600 meters capability. And in our configuration, it has a dive duration of 20 hours at a speed of three knots. And just to put that in perspective, when we survey for squid from a surface ship, we travel at about five knots. So this is a reasonably um, fast survey platform for us. And we've Im integrated two scientific echo sounders at 38 and 120 kilohertz, both of which in this case are split beam um, echo sounders. You see that little fat section in the nose? That's the location of the low frequency transducer. And then the um, middle section is uh, the location of the electronics for this uh, system. We affectionately call this platform Dory because she speaks to whales. So this is a uh, rendition of what that looks like. You see those orange um, things in the front there that are the location of the echo sounder transducers. In the middle section, you can see a dry payload bay that carries the echo sounder electronics and two um, computing uh, devices that both record and analyze the data. <clears throat> and then the back section, which contains the uh, other sensor controls for the vehicle as well as the drive control systems. The two echo sounders talk to a single um, microformat computer that controls and acquires the data. That talks to a computer in the back of the vehicle and receives GPS data as well as depth, so it knows um, and stamps that right onto the data so we know where the data was collected. There's also a second computer inside the vehicle that the control computer passes the data off to, and that um, processes the data using uh, uh, standard software that we use to analyze uh, echo sounder data. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, it actually runs EchoView in real time, processes that data, and then determines whether there are targets of interest um, or not. And if there are, it tells a secondary computer in the vehicle that it wants to stick around and do some more sampling in areas of interest. So it hands over control to what we call a backseat driver. <coughs> 
that allows us to collect a lot more data in areas where we are seeing interesting things. So this is a little video uh, that will give you an idea of how Dory is put together and how this works. You can see that it's um, a modular system, and we can change out payload bays, add additional payload bays, so we can add battery life to our typical 20-hour configuration. And all of these uh, sections are held together um, it, it, with uh, uh, clamping rings that um, allow us to be able to ship and transport this. The, this vehicle platform is relatively light. It's much smaller than in other platforms that have been instrumented. It weighs less than 1,000 pounds. And you can see we can deploy it into the water with a pretty small crane. And it swims off by itself uh, until it reaches a, a pre-configured location and then begins to dive. At that point, you can see the real-time data that we're acquiring from this particular dive. And this data is being, again, processed in real time by a secondary computer in the uh, vehicle that decides whether things of interest are happening. And in this case, nothing is seen, so the vehicle keeps driving. But when it later sees a squid, it starts to change its um, uh, configuration and drives in a, a more detailed pattern, which starts to give us more information where we're seeing targets of interest. So we think this vehicle has a lot of capabilities as we um, continue to look f at the future on uh, looking at uh, squid in deep water. So for this study, we combined the AUV with ship-based echo sounders um, covering nearly 300 kilometers around the Channel Islands. And we used the ship to be able to sample the upper water column and the AUV the deeper water column, and also used the ship to provide a, a range of direct sampling approaches to identify organisms that we were getting scattering from with the goal of effectively sea truthing squid, fish, as well as crustacean targets. So the data I'm going to talk about today was collected off San Clemente Island. And this is an area referred to as the SOAR or SCORE range. This is a Navy testing area. And because of the location of, um, here, there's a high incidence of interaction between beaked whales and humans. But it's also an area where there's a lot of data. There are 88 seafloor mounted hydrophones within the red box shown there on the map. And these hydrophones are often used to monitor the location and uh, uh, acoustic behavior of beaked whales. And so we know a lot about how animals are using this habitat and where they're found within this region. So we know from, <coughs> excuse me, from these um, seafloor mounted hydrophones, how animals have used this area within the SOAR Navy test range in the past. And the area um, it to the northwest is used very extensively by these animals. There's a lot of detections of animals um, within this part of the Navy test range, while in the area to the east, which looks largely similar from an oceanographic perspective, these animals aren't seen very often. Now, interestingly, the area immediately to the north-northwest of the range is not used extensively either. So the first question we wanted to address with our surveys was, is the habitat driving these um, differences in habitat use, and, and it, could this be related to prey? Now, during surface sonar exercises, the habitat use changes. Animals leave that northwest part of the range and move to the area immediately to the northwest. And so our second question in this was, could that be presenting a cost in terms of access to prey for these animals? To address this, we used a, a stratified sampling design um, based on the information we know about how animals are using the range. We conducted 10-kilometer uh, long acoustic transects with both the ship and AUV, as well as all of our complementary uh, uh, direct sampling approaches, and conducted a block design conducted transects in each of these regions. With the high habitat use area to the north-northwest of the range, a low habitat use area in the east side of the range, and then an area I'll refer to as contingent, just adjacent to the range. In other words, animals only use this habitat when range activities are occurring, particularly um, anti-submarine warfare exercises. <coughs> 
Now, the first thing we looked at was a measure of integrated biomass through the entire water column and compared this um, by how animals were using the habitat. And so the y-axis here is um, a measure of the uh, total availability of prey in the first box in the upper 1,200 meters of the water column. Um, <clears throat> again, broken up by whether animals are in, uh, use this area extensively. Um, in yellow, don't use this area much at all. In dark blue, and then that contingent habitat in the middle in light blue. And interestingly, when we look across these different habitats, we don't see any significant differences if we look at the total prey availability through the entire water column. Looking only at the upper water column, we do see a significant difference, with the low-use habitat having significantly higher biomass than the high-use habitat. Focusing on the data collected from the autonomous vehicle, from 600 to 1,200 meters, we do again see a significant difference, and this time the pattern is opposite, with the area having the highest use having the highest biomass. Now, the first thing I want to point out here is that it's interesting that the surface biomass and the deep water biomass aren't um, correlated with each other. We see opposite patterns. And that presents some challenges as we think about um, what measures we need to make. It's um, been extremely difficult to sample these deep water resources, and so there have been attempts made to use surface water proxies. And it's clear from um, these first results that that um, will make an understanding beaked whale behavior particularly difficult. Now, looking just at the prey um, that's likely to be consumed by beaked whales, that range between 900 and 1,200 meters, where we know from tag studies in this area in the past that these animals are actively feeding, we again see a significant difference in the total biomass of prey. And in fact, it's even higher than when we look at um, the entire range of the AUV's data, with um, the high use area being significantly higher in prey biomass. But when I look at these data, I don't find those differences particularly compelling. If you look across all of the different depth ranges and all the different conditions, the high-use um, prey looks largely the same despite differences amongst the low um, habitat conditions. And so I think it's unlikely that total biomass, which is something we typically measure when we're thinking about uh, uh, estimates of prey resources, are really what's driving beaked whale behavior. Another way to think about this, instead of thinking about the total integrated scattering, is to try to see what targets we can see individually. And that would be slightly larger prey that are separated from other uh, neighboring prey that we can actually um, uh, resolve them independently. If we look at those individual targets, instead of seeing a three and a half fold difference between high and low habitat areas, we start to see an order of magnitude difference between those high and low use areas. And so perhaps these targets are something we should be focusing on further, rather than looking at the total biomass of prey. But despite the fact that these um, individual prey can be resolved, they are not uniformly distributed, nor are they necessarily independent of each other. And so we started to look at the patchiness in these individual prey and how that changes as we break our transects down into smaller and smaller pieces. So on the y-axis here is a measure of variance, a measure of patchiness by comparing um, these different sized segments. And we've um, uh, normalized these to the variance at 10 kilometers, the difference between transects. So at 10 kilometers, our measure here is 1, and that's our, our neutral value. And as we break the transects down into smaller and smaller pieces, we would expect that the variance would increase slightly as we start to look at smaller and smaller segments and have potentially uh, smaller sample sizes with more potential for variation. And that's indeed what we see when we look at the low-use habitat regions. And similarly, we see a slight increase in that variance as we look at the contingent habitat. But the pattern when we look at the high-use habitat is quite different. Instead of just gradually increasing, as we might expect from a random distribution that's broken up into smaller samples, we see a dramatic increase in that level of variance, particularly as we approach 100 meters and then 10 meters, which is about the resolution we can expect within these data. And so what that means is that the 100 meter scale, we might have a large number of, of, of individual targets within 100 meter section, and then the next essentially have zero. Well, in the low-use habitat, we have a ra relatively close to random distribution um, with a fairly even a number of these individual targets in each 100-meter or 10-meter section of a transect. <clears throat> 
And this has really important implications for uh, predators, particularly those that are air breathing, and these guys with uh, incredibly deep dives, and how many prey they can acquire on a single dive that directly impacts the distance between one prey and the next. So I've put the error bars on here uh, to show you that it really isn't um, uh, simply a, um, a increasing variance, that there is a distinctive pattern within these high-use habitats that, that is quite different from the low-use habitat regions. So our next question about these prey was what might they be? And we can get at that in part by looking at the differences in the uh, two different echo sounders and the response we get at these two different frequencies, where if we were to be expecting fish targets, we would anticipate that the difference in scattering between the two would be quite similar, and we'd uh, expect a, a mode in our data at zero. Whereas if we were looking at squid, as I mentioned earlier, um, we would lose a lot of the high frequency information, and so we would expect stronger scattering at 38 kilohertz, and we'd expect data to show up at that line around 6 dB. Now, I'm going to show you these data as a, a uh, histogram, as a percent of observations within each site. And so you can get a relative sense of how many uh, fish there are in the system um, versus the number of squid. And in the low-use habitats, you see two dis um, modes within the data. And so there are both fish and squid well represented within the data set. In the moderate use, the contingent-use habitat, we see that there are um, significantly more squid than there are uh, in the low-use habitat, and that mode is more distinctive. Finally, when we're looking at the high-use habitat, we see an even more striking pattern with significantly greater percentage of squid than fish um, relative to these other two habitat types. In fact, the net percent of squid targets in the low-use habitat is about 30%, while more than half of the targets we identify as consistent with squid in the high-use habitat. But this data, really looking at it as a percent of observations, doesn't highlight the differences between these habitats in terms of the number of squid available, and that's really what's important to the predator. So I'm going to replot these same data as average counts per transect um, instead of as a percent of observations. And here you can see just how strikingly different the abundance of squid is in the high use relative to the low use habitat. In fact, that squid hump in the low use habitat is almost impossible to see. So in the low-use habitat, there are uh, probably 900 squid per 10-kilometer transect, while the high-use habitat has 13,000 squid per 10-kilometer transect. And we can take that tenfold difference we saw early on in the data between the low and high-use habitats in terms of prey availability and bump that to a 15-fold difference between low and high-use habitat, which gives us some pretty clear indications of why beaked whales might be using this habitat much more extensively. The next question, of course, is how big are these squid, and are there size differences between the different habitat usage areas? And we can get at that by looking at the target strength. That is uh, the measure of the acoustic intensity uh, for these. And again, I'm plotting this as a percent of observations and uh, as a, uh, relative to the target strength. The low-use habitat has a um, mode in the data that is equivalent to about a 16 centimeter squid if our measurements of target strength to length from midwater and shallow water species are accurate for these deep water individual squid. The high use habitat has a much different distribution with a med uh, median size of 22 centimeters, so a significantly larger um, squid in the high relative to the low use habitat. And as I mentioned, we don't have good length to target strength relationship curves for these deep water species because they are so difficult to bring up and impossible to bring up alive um, in previous efforts. But we can say that the relative differences in these size, sizes is um, um, consistent, even if we're not absolutely accurate on their absolute size. So we're seeing a 40% increase in the size of the squid in the high relative to the low use habitat. Now, you may have noticed that in every plot I've shown you so far, the contingent use habitat kind of shows up in between the low and high use in most of its characteristics. But in terms of squid size, uh, the contingent habitat looks much more like the high use habitat than the low, 
with, again, a median size of squid of about 22 centimeters equivalent. And so that might be the reason why these uh, beaked whales are using this habitat, its proximity to the range, as well as the relatively large size of potential prey targets. So to go back to our questions, does prey drive beaked whale distributions? And summarize our results. Well, clearly, prey is better in the preferred beaked whale habitat in the depth range at which they're foraging relative to adjacent sites. The total prey biomass is a little over threefold higher. Solitary prey, those ones we can identify individually, are an order of magnitude more abundant. And they're clustered at the scale of 10 to to hundreds of meters rather than homogeneous. And this, we know, has really important implications for predator foraging tactics. Squid account for 20% more of the prey in the high use relative to the low use habitat, which may play an important role in how predators select prey and making them more efficient foragers. And there's a 15-fold higher abundance of squid, again, potentially reducing the cost of selecting prey while providing greater access to prey. And finally, these squid are about 40% larger in the high use relative to the low use habitat. So there are a lot of benefits for beaked whales in using the area that they do relative to the area that we think looks largely similar, but in fact, in terms of prey resources, is quite different. Thinking about what the foraging costs might be and um, in terms of the, when there is sonar activity on the range and animals are leaving to that area adjacent to the range, that area is intermediate in prey characteristics between the low and high use habitat. Relative to the preferred habitat, there are 50% 50, 50 total uh, lower prey biomass, 70% fewer individual prey, it's 85% less patchy, with 20% lower proportion of squid, 75% fewer total individual squid, but those squid are similar in size. So I've been doing some simple um, calculations to think about what this really means in terms of a foraging predator. And specifically, um, thinking about what we know about beaked whales and trying to combine our information with what we know about foraging behavior of these animals from the behavioral recording tags um, with work done by Peter Tyak's group in particular. We've measured the mean prey spacing from uh, within the, these three different habitat sites using the deep water um, AUV. And we've measured that um, at over three kilometers in the low use habitat, but just a couple of hundred meters in the high use habitat. But even this measure of mean prey spacing doesn't really get at the situation facing predators because of how differently distributed the prey is in the low relative to the high use habitat. And you can see that when you look at the mode measurement of the spacing between prey. The, in the low use habitat, the mode in the data is quite similar to the mean at over three kilometers. But in the high use habitat, that distance metric decreases rather dramatically because this prey is so heterogeneously distributed. I, um, you either find prey 50 meters or so away from another prey, or it's a great distance away if you leave the existing patch. So converting these measurements Um, by thinking about how far a predator, a beaked whale, would have to swim in order to capture 30 of these prey, and then what speed they'd need to move just to encounter those 30 prey, we can think about how realistic this might be. Now, we know from um, previous work published by, uh, uh, by, by Peter Tyek and some of his uh, colleagues that 30 prey is about how many um, uh, individual attempts there are in a typical beaked whale dive. And so in the low use habitat, that means that a beaked whale would have to swim over 50 meters a second in order to encounter 30 prey. We know that they, uh, their velocities cannot be that great, that they swim at, at most eight meters per second um, in, in response studies. And so that means that, that to encounter that many prey would be highly unlikely for this predator. The high use habitat, they would only have to swim one meter per second, and we know from from some of those tagging studies that they are capable of doing that. In fact, prey uh, uh, velocities when they're encountering prey are at least 
1.4 meters per second during prey capture attempts. And so this is completely reasonable. Another way we can think about this, though, is trying to incorporate those differences in prey size amongst those different uh, habitat types, because just the distribution alone doesn't tell us how successful a predator might be. And so we can convert that to thinking about how many prey might be captured on an individual dive given a specific velocity. And here I've used a, a velocity of three meters per second, which is a, a reasonable um, uh, estimate for their foraging speed. We can debate those, but this gives us some metric to compare to. So on a, in the low-use habitat, a predator, if they encounter a prey immediately at the bottom of a dive, might be able to catch three prey. Well, in the high-use habitat, they'd get 96 and in the contingent habitat, seven. Those prey mode lengths that we've measured in those different habitats, we can attempt to convert to the calories per individual prey to think about the energetic needs of these predators. And again, getting back to that idea of body condition at a very short time scale. So the high and contingent use habitat would have the same caloric value prey, um, but the low use habitat would be significantly lower. And we can estimate how many dives that predator would need in a given day to meet its baseline metabolic needs. In the high-use habitat, um, to meet their basic metabolic needs, not accounting for the cost of foraging or reproduction, those animals would need uh, uh, on the order of one or two dives a day. We know that these predators exhibit typically on the order of uh, 12 to 13 dives in a given day when they're in tagging studies. And so an animal in the high-use habitat would very easily be able to meet its energetic needs as well as um, exceed those basic needs to account for the cost of foraging, growth, and reproduction. Clearly, the animal in the low-use low habitat isn't going to be able to make it. 84 dives a day greatly exceeds the uh, time available as well as its uh, restrictions for diving. But the contingent habitat gets really interesting. Clearly, we need to think very carefully about the metrics we're using because in this case, the animal is quite close to that dive limit with uh, estimated 12 dives a day to meet its basic metabolic needs. So um, while we can debate the specific numbers, the assumptions across these different habitat types um, in these calculations are all the same. And this gives us a way to think about both what measures are important in predicting predator energy um, uh, needs and, and how they meet them and gives us some metric and co to compare what the costs might be. And so you can see very clearly that the low-use habitat is not a great place to be a beaked whale, and clear the beaked whales have figured that out. The high-use habitat seems to be a pretty darn good place to be a beaked whale, and that might be why these animals keep returning to the site despite the disturbance. But the contingent-use habitat seems to be a make the best of a bad situation um, because it, it uh, is marginally productive for these predators. Now, to get at this in a more quantitative way than we've been able to do by combining previous tagging studies with our measures of prey, we would really like to be able to capture the behavior of an individual predator while simultaneously observing the prey field. And while we were unable to do this with beaked whales, as, they, uh, as, as, as Patrick mentioned, are incredibly difficult to tag, we were successful in our first attempt at combining these metrics with a mid um, depth diving squid eater, the Rizzo's dolphin. And so we're working in on analyses there and hope to be able to use this as a model um, for combining these two different types of data sets and for thinking about how we quantitatively put these data together. So our conclusions. Uh, for beak twelve that score at least during our study period, We've been able to um, develop a new tool for quantifying deep water biology, and, and particularly to be able to look at deep water squid, which is an exciting advance, both for the um, understanding of marine mammal ecology, but also for understanding the basic biology of these squid, which we know so little about. It's interesting that the upper water column measures we were able to make of prey turned out not to be very good predictors of deep water prey resources, which means we need to think very carefully about how we um, utilize much more easily available measures and whether they can serve as useful proxies. We found that the prey were strikingly different in regions 
in and adjacent to the Navy's range in Southern California. In fact, more strikingly than we were expecting from the physical conditions alone, which leads us to ask some exciting questions about the um, drivers of the biology in these deep water systems. And we've been able to identify some key prey parameters for figuring out these differences that might be important to a predator. In particular, the distribution of squid, how patchy they are, as well as the size of those individual prey resources. Where it's clear that prey is um, an important driver of habitat use in many predators, and it's strongly correlated with the observed habitat use of beaked whales in this range area. So the, we've also shown here that the potential costs of sonar activities on the range are high as these animals move to the contingent use habitat. And while it's difficult to put specific numbers on them at this point without the um, uh, coupled tagging data, we can see those relative differences with an order of magnitude decrease in the energetic gains of foraging in the contingent use habitat relative to their preferred area within the range. So a very brief discussion about how this might affect management at SCORE, or how may, we might think about this. It certainly helped us raise some new questions. We would love to know if there are seasonal patterns in these prey distributions. How stable are these differences that we saw, and are they always of this magnitude? Are there any behavioral adaptations by the predator in terms of behavior or prey selection that might um, mitigate some of the differences that we saw or change the um, relative magnitude of these? Are there other areas of rich prey in uh, areas adjacent to this area? And what fraction of the local population relies on SCORE and how often? It will be really critical in assessing um, the importance of these at a population level. And while our idea here of using an energy budget approach certainly isn't new and is something that the uh, DOD has been investing heavily in, is in thinking about how disturbance might affect these animals, we think that the data that we're um, obtaining provides some of the inputs that have been um, difficult to get to in these previous efforts. Being able to provide the prey resource estimates um, in the input side of these energy budgets is really critical. We'd love to know um, how to do calculations with these or think about how to do calculations with these during energy critical periods and whether energy critical periods could be avoided um, when prey differences might be the greatest or when animals are experiencing external stresses, uh, for example, uh, weaning periods or during reproduction. And we think we can use some of these numbers as we uh, continue to obtain them and get a greater data set about these um, temporal and spatial patterns to think about what duration these food reduction tolerances can, <coughs> um, these food reductions can be tolerated. And in that uh, vein, it would be fantastic to combine the kind of data we're collecting with the measurements of body condition that Patrick is um, now being able to make to really think about both the, the input side as well as the resulting um, pattern so we can get at process. And of course, um, we're excited to be working to put these data together with those existing population level effects models and starting to provide some of the inputs to that um, that are, uh, have been unattainable until recently. Uh, so with that, I think we're ready to take questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. And we do have a number of questions that have been coming in. And we have about five minutes for questions from your talk. The first question is, do you think that the naval activities could be impacting the squid as well, particularly in the very deep water? That's a great question. Um, we've been thinking a lot about that and have been um, figuring out how to design studies to be able to test that. It's quite possible that the Navy activities do affect the squid, though it's unlikely that it's directly through them hearing the sonar signals. Uh, recent work that's been done on how squid hear shows that they are not, um, uh, they don't have a very well-developed um, auditory system. But there are likely other mechanisms that could impact them as well. And so we've been thinking a lot about how we might go about doing that. It does present some challenges. Um, 
it, we were thinking of this primarily as a baseline study to study the, the habitat use and behavior of these animals, the, the marine mammals. Um, to get at that direct effect, we'd have to think strongly about how we interact with the uh, operational Navy, which is a, an entirely different um, scope of study. Mm -hmm. And I know you're focusing on the prey, but has there been any concern about the impact of the active sonar from the surface vessel on the beaked whale, particularly the 38 kilohertz sonar? Right, and, and um, that's uh, there have been some uh, some studies trying to look at the impact of these high-frequency, narrow-band, narrow-beam systems on marine mammals. And there have been relatively, um, they, though those have been relatively limited, observations of behavioral uh, responses to those sonars um, have not yet been observed. Uh, these systems work quite differently than the Navy sonars. Again, they're, um, while they're within the 38 kilohertz, as Larry points out, is within the hearing range of these animals. They are um, uh, much less intense and much narrower beam than, than a, a tactical sonar. Um, and so we were carefully thinking about this, and we've been analyzing the um, data from the range in the uh, how beaked whales are using the habitat during our study, as well as what our sonar actually sounds like on the range to try to get at that um, as part of this work. Um, so it's certainly something that we're considering. And what are your thoughts on um, on the beach whale's intake of small prey? We had a comment that indicated that their stomach contents analyses show lots of small prey. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm not I'm not um, assuming that necessarily that they prefer the large prey, but that there are large prey available and that those provide more energy. We do need to think about the catchability of the prey as we kind of um, become more sophisticated in thinking about this analysis of, and how we put this into quantitative terms, these differences between habitat locations. Um, so certainly that's a, a big part of the picture. Um, I think the interesting thing from the sensitivity analyses we've done with this really simple uh, quantification is that prey size matters, but it doesn't matter nearly as much as prey distribution. That distance between individual prey is what affects the prey encounter rate most um, and ultimately affects the number of dives an animal would have to do to, to get enough prey um, most. The, the prey size is a relatively um, smaller component of that. But we'd really love to be able to get at the selectivity and I think being able to couple the um, tagging studies as behavior with our prey studies would help us get to that. Great, great. thank you. And we have just a few minutes left. And so Patrick and Kelly, um, I'd like to ask you to leave us with the um, top take-home message for end users from this research. And I'll start first with Kelly, if that's OK. Um, is it the distribution of the prey, or is it a different top message that you'd like to leave? Well, I think it's um, pretty clear from the work that we're doing that the measurements we're able to make at the surface, while easy, aren't necessarily applicable. And so we need to think a lot about how we penetrate the depths at which these animals are, are spending most of their time and um, what creative ways we can, we can uh, use to get there. And um, certainly Patrick's work is, is one of the ways where we're seeing the results of, of what's happening in, at depth. And um, we need to kind of combine all of those creative metrics together to, to really start to understand the importance um, of, of um, their vital processes and the results that we're seeing. Excellent. Thank you. And Patrick? Yes, I, I, I'd actually really like to uh, second what, what Kelly is speaking to there, that uh, essentially the, the environment that these animals live in are ult is ultimately what gives them the opportunity to make their living. And w the human influence on the environment is it, it, it differs in different areas. So in some locations, we may have a larger impact than other areas. And the ability of the animals to sort of compensate for the effects really depends upon the overall environmental variability and how the animals can access it. So the world is, is quite complex. I mean, and the tools that we've seen, uh, especially Kelly's uh, uh, new tool here for mapping deep prey fields, I feel really opens up a whole new world for us to understand the habitat of these animals much more broadly across the world's oceans, uh, which will really uh, be a real game changer in our understanding of their behavioral ecology. Excellent. 
And on behalf of CERDIP and EOCCP, I would like to thank our two speakers and also thank you all for attending today's webinar. And as a reminder, the presentation and the audio will be archived for future reference on the CERDIP and EOCCP webpage. Our next webinar is on November 20th, and it will focus on new tools for improving the management of contaminated sediment sites. And that webinar will also feature two presenters, Dr. Phil Geschwind from MIT and Dr. Bart Chadwick from the Spaywar Systems Center Pacific. And as a reminder, um, there will be a survey that comes up after uh, the, the conclusion of, of the audio. And that survey, we'd like you to help out. It will help us select future webinar topics and also help us evaluate how this program is meeting its objectives of technology transfer. Mm -hmm. And this concludes today's webcast. Thank you all. <laughs>